Good morning, friends. Welcome to another Field Trip Friday. My name's Steve. And I'm Tanika. Good morning. And today we are really excited that all of you could join us today. And we're going to be heading over to the Piedmont Wildlife Center right here in Durham. So thank you so much, Grace Bowman, for joining us. And we are really excited. You took us on some really cool adventures and we can't wait for the students to see it. And so each Friday, we also host a different DPS classroom. So today we have Miss Weaver's class from Y.E. Smith. Good morning, all of you. And I was telling Miss Weaver that my aunt works over there. So maybe you had my aunt in pre-K. Her name is Miss Walker. She might have taught you in pre-K. I think that'd be kind of cool how the circle of Durham really works, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, cool. So I got to show your, your uh, picture of your school. So I hope you all got a chance to recognize the front of your school. Um, I want to remind you all that um, during the, the video, you can chat us questions. So um, as things are popping up and you see things that are curious to you or things you're interested in or just ideas you're thinking about that this video inspires, feel free to drop us a line in the chat and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it after the video in our live Q&A with Grace. Yay. So I'm going to start sharing. everyone. Welcome to another Field Trip Friday. My name's Steve. And I'm Tanika. Where are we going today, Tanika? So today we are at the Piedmont Wildlife Center right here in the heart of Durham. Oh, I'm so excited. We're going to see all sorts of awesome things and learn about conservation. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Come on. Come on, friends. Well, thanks for having us, Grace. Can you tell us who you are and what you do here? Yeah, so um, my name is Grace Bowman. I'm the conservation assistant here at Piedmont Wildlife Center. So I've been here for a couple years. I started off as an intern in 2018, right out of college. I graduated from UNC and I uh, kind of just stuck around, ended up um, working a little bit with our education team. Um, and then this position opened up and I applied for it and here I am. So. Um, so my main jobs are taking care of our ambassador animals. So we have lots of animals that we'll show you later on, but got raptors, so birds of prey. Um, we have some small mammals. We have plenty of reptiles as well. So kind of day in, day out, just making sure they're all taken care of. Um, and then I also head up our box turtle study. Um, so we have an on-site study that we'd use radio telemetry for, which I'll show you about later as well. Um, and we also do a mark and recapture program. Um, and that's part of a project called the Box Turtle Connection. So it's been going on for 10 years now and cool. it's supposed to be a hundred year study. Wow. So cool. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're really long lived creatures. Yeah. So uh, the goal really is to keep it going as long as we can so you can get kind of a holistic sort of baseline understanding of box turtles because honestly we don't know a whole lot about them other than that their populations are declining so mm -hmm. yeah so that's really what I do here day in day out but I do plenty of other things too. That's really cool. Yeah. Absolutely. So can you give us a little information about the Piedmont Wildlife Center and what happens yeah. here on a daily basis? Yeah so Piedmont was founded and I wish I knew the exact year but I don't off the top of my head but probably about 30 years ago. Um, we used to do rehabilitation, so we used to be a rehab center. It wasn't at this particular location, it was, I believe, in Raleigh. Um, and so we used to take in injured wildlife or orphaned wildlife, so babies without their parents, so on their own, um, unable to fend for themselves. So what they would do is try to make them better, and if they could release them back into the wild, they would, but if it was too sick or too injured, um, they would end up in places like what we are now, which is just an educational facility. So we no longer do rehab. Um, and so we've kind of pivoted towards education. So we have these ambassador animals. So they're kind of considered ambassadors for their species. Um, and then we use them in programming to talk about conservation and how to protect those species. Um, so yeah, we no longer do that, but 
we've been at this location for, I believe, about 15 years or so. So Grace, uh, where, where are we now? Yeah, so we're in front of our barred owl enclosure. So we've got two owls in here. We have Apollo on the right up here. He's probably gonna fly around a bunch. And then Athena's in the back here just hanging out. She's one of our older birds, so she likes to pretty much spend most of her time in one place. Apollo is still kind of, we call him an angsty teen, so he, he kind of moves around a lot. Um, always checking things out, always moving his head around, so yeah. Um, we have had both of them for several years, but um, Athena for a much longer time. Apollo actually came in, um, so he came into rehab at the Carolina Raptor Center as a juvenile, so he was um, not quite a baby, but not quite an adult, and he had fallen out of the nest, I believe, so um, he had injuries to his wing as a result of that. Um, and they were able to kind of fix the wing, but what happened was it was still making noise when he flapped his wings. And for owls, silent flight is really important for hunting. So if they do make any sort of noise, that kind of eliminates their ability to hunt effectively. So that really reduces their chances of surviving in the wild. Um, so that's the main reason why he's here with us now. Otherwise, he's a really healthy bird, really happy bird. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Carolina Raptor Center is a, is a rehabilitation um, space for, for raptors? Right, yeah. yeah. So they're one of the biggest rehab centers um, in the country, really, but especially on the East Coast. So they're in Charlotte, North Carolina, so about three hours from here. Yeah. So yeah, they do kind of the bulk of raptor rehab around here. Oh my gosh, Grace, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> so this handsome man is Otis. Um, so he is an eastern screech owl. Um, he's actually the red morph, so there's two different types of morphs or colors that they can be. But he is a red one, um, kind of reddish-orange, kind of rusty colored. Um, and then the other type is the gray morph, which we also have one of those as well. His name is Ash. Um, and so they, it's a way of camouflaging into different types of trees, so it helps them blend in with their environments really well. Um, but yeah, so Otis is actually our oldest raptor, so he's about probably about 17 or 18 years old. So. Wow. Yeah, he's been here for quite some time. But yeah, so Otis is still, you know, got plenty of life in him. He's, he's super curious. Um, I would say he's probably a fan favorite. Um, a lot of people think he's still a baby just because of how small he is, but he is fully grown, like we mentioned. Um, so yeah. So tell us a little bit about how he ended up here with you all. Yeah, so his story is actually kind of interesting, a little bit different from some of the other birds we've had. So he was found at the bottom of an office building, of all places. Um, so he had actually flown into a window, they believe. So happens quite a bit with lots of birds. Um, I, I don't know the details ar around Otis's story, but my guess is um, with him being nocturnal, hunting at night, maybe he saw a light on um, and he flew into the window because he was attracted to that. That's just maybe a guess I have. Um, but it happens to lots of migratory birds as well when they're when they're going through their migration. Um, you know, they're not thinking of windows. They don't know what a window is. So um, things that are clear, they, they might just run straight into them. So that can be a really big threat for, for birds. Yeah, so he was brought in. He had injuries to his wing. You can kind of see this left wing of his um, doesn't really sit as, as neatly as the other one. Um, so there were definitely some injuries there that didn't heal completely. So, so yeah, that is why he is here. He doesn't fly. Um, he can kind of flap around. He hops around quite a bit in his enclosure, but he lives pretty much on the ground. We've got some perches really low on the ground that he sits on. And that's why I'm holding him like this as well, is um, he can't perch on a glove normally um, because of these injuries. So I have to hold my hand out kind of like a bowl to, to hold him. Right, normally you'd have a kind of like a perch. Right, yeah, you can be mimicking what a, a branch or something would be like. Yeah, so in this way, I'm kind of modifying it for him. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for introducing us to Otis. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's probably one of my favorites. I shouldn't have favorites, but he's, he's, on, <laughs> he's near the top of the list <laughs> for lots of us, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. he is adorable. So, Grace, can you tell us a little bit about who we have right here? Yeah, so this is Edgar. Um, he is a raven. Um, so not normally a bird we see around here in the Piedmont um, in North Carolina, but he was actually found in Washington State. Um, believe it or not, he was shot, I think, four times by a hunter wow. um, and survived to tell the tale. So yeah, we're really glad he's here. Um, so he is actually a bird that we have to do a lot of enrichment with. So corvids in general, so birds like um, crows, ravens, blue jays, um, which I know you guys have at the museum. Yeah. Um, they're really, really smart creatures. They know how to, to cache or hide their food um, for future use, which is not a, a trait. 
high anchor. <laughs> Not a trait that um, all animals have. Um, so we, we try to do some things to kind of have him work his brain in the way he would in the wild. So some of the ways we do that are giving him some different toys and puzzles. Um, and we play games with him um, throughout the week just to give him some of that enrichment. I talked about that earlier. Um, so. Yeah, so some of the things we do, we have two volunteers at least that come in throughout the week and spend some time with him. So some of them will actually read stories to him just to get his brain going. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll have games where we hide peanuts, which are his favorite, um, in his enclosure or in these little contraptments that he has to figure out how to get apart. Mm. Um, get him using his, his mind and his body. So right. his beak is something that he uses a lot for pecking things out. He loves to eat eggs, um, loves to open up peanut shells. Um, anything that can kind of, he has to work for, um, yeah, are really great for him. Yeah, so we were talking about how his beak, beak looks so large, but he does a great job of like poking small holes into things in order to get what he wants. Yeah, he can be really, really precise with his beak. Um, we have a couple toys that we use where, um, and we might be able to show you a little bit more close, but we have some toys that are actually made for dogs, I think. But there are these little notches on the end of them, really small, like kind of the, the size that you would have to use your fingernail to kind of lift up. But he can use his beak and kind of gently pull that up to see what's underneath the caps um, and see if there's a, a peanut or something hidden in there for him. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks so too. <laughs> All right, Grace, can you tell us who we're meeting right now? Yeah, so this is Bob, and Bob is one of our eastern box turtles that is also one of our ambassador animals. So we've got five box turtles that live with us inside this cabin behind me. Um, and he's one of our three or four possibly males. Um, I can get into a little bit of how to tell between a male and female, and sometimes it's not always cut and dry. We're actually not sure about one of our, our box turtles, so. Um, but we know for sure he's a male. A couple ways we know is he's got this really bright coloration that we tend to see in males. He has really bright red eyes. And there's a few other things. Um, if I were to show you his belly here, this is what we call the plastron. He's got this kind of big dip I can kind of stick my thumb in. And that's what, one way to tell a male as well is they have this big dip, or they tend to rather. Um, other thing is that if I show you the back of his shell here, the top part is called the carapace. You can see this kind of bell shape that goes out, sort of flares out. We tend to see that in males as well. So he's got pretty much all the characteristics that we would tend to see in a male turtle. So we can be pretty sure that he's a male. Awesome. Cool. So what are we up to? What's, what's happening here, Grace? And, and who's our new friend? <laughs> so this is Adrienne. She's one of our interns uh, this spring. And we're about to go uh, turtle tracking. So we're going we're gonna to do some radio telemetry, like I mentioned earlier. Um, using this receiver here. Um, so I can get you a little bit of a background on what all this is. So those eight turtles, like I mentioned, they have a transmitter or just a little kind of like gray golf ball looking thing on their shell. And we've attached it using a really strong uh, marine epoxy or glue. Um, and that keeps it on the shell. And that releases a signal, kind of like a radio station would. And this receiver receives that signal. So when we want to track a turtle, we actually will tune in to that turtle's channel. Um, so each turtle has their own channel and then turn the receiver on and then we'll get a signal. And basically it's like a treasure hunt. So the louder the signal is, the closer we are. So we follow that signal as we go forward. So we'll move the receiver around and wherever we get the loudest signal, we walk in that direction. Oh, okay. Yeah. A box turtle treasure hunt sounds so amazing. It's been so much fun. <laughs> I have no better way to spend my spring. <laughs> sounds like happy feet to me. So exactly, right? To All right. <laughs> yeah, let's get going. Yeah. Right. So we're going to find um, our turtle that we've labeled OPQ, and he's on channel five. So I'm going to get myself to five. You have to kind of... All right, and let's turn him on. Oh, yeah. yeah. That clicking? A beeping now noise, yeah. So, um, in the beginning, I can usually turn it up pretty loud. That kind of tells, uh, turning up the gain is basically, it kind of gives me like, like range. And as I get closer, I turn the gain down to make sure I'm like triangulating it on him. Right. So, right. if I point this way, that beep happens. And if I point this way, can you kind of hear how yeah, it it's more fainter. quiet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to head in this direction. All
So that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you thought so. I think so too. Yeah, that was so fun. And so I, I guess I just want to um, kind of dive in a little bit as to we've we've gotten to see so much of this really cool work that you're doing out here, and we've been kind of leading up to these, these this kind of deeper conversation about why conservation. And I was wondering what what are your thoughts on that, Grace? Yeah, I mean it's a big question, but I think you know it's easy day in day out to kind of forget why you're doing what you're doing you know when you're here you know i'm you know we're tracking the turtles we're taking care of these animals and i love doing it but yeah it is easy to kind of lose sight of the 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 big picture right of conservation like what is it so um i think like i said earlier there are lots of different pieces to the puzzle as far as what it means to conserve wildlife right so Part of that, I think a huge part of what we do here is educating the public about those species, the species that need that extra attention. So box turtles, I don't think I mentioned, are um, classified as vulnerable by the IUCN. So really, if we don't do anything to kind of help them out, they're probably going like, to become endangered. So that's where we're directing our attention and our energy is those, those species that need that. Um, we know that their populations are decreasing, you know. so. It's really figuring out what species need help um, and, and what we can do to help them and, and help protect them. So obviously having this data of where the box turtles are, what they're up to, um, you know, how long they're living, what, what's, uh, if we do find any that are no longer living, you know, what was the cause of that? Having all that data is really useful. So, you know, with this being a hundred year study, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we can see these trends over time. Um, so I think that's what's really important um, in my job is just making sure that data is getting collected so we can have, you know, this big, you know, multi-year study to, to look back on. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's lots of different ways you can contribute to the field of conservation and the, these are just some of the ways you can do that. Grace, thank you so much for having us today at the Piedmont Wildlife Center. Um, it's been really interesting to see all the animals that you have here and really get a chance to see what you do in order to preserve the box turtles that we see here in North Carolina. It's been really great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, I really love having you guys here and I'm glad you enjoyed getting to meet all the animals and learn a little bit more about what we do because yeah, I kind of feel like we're a little bit of a hidden gem in, in Durham. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad you guys came by. Agreed. You are definitely a hidden gem. Thank you so much for having us. Um, everyone watching, stay tuned for the live Q&A. We'll get to ask Grace all sorts of awesome wildlife questions. We'll see you there. See ya. was so fun. We had such a good time. Um, it, it's always always so hard um, getting the the grandeur of a trip that we've taken into just 15 minutes. We 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 really got to see so much amazing stuff um, when we when we visited. Um, and thank you all for being so curious about the things that we did get to show you. Um, so I'd love to hear some of the amazing questions that uh, that were asked, and then we can start talking about what about maybe some, if we have answers to them, we can talk about answers. If there are broader questions, we can just talk about them. So uh, Ms. Weaver, would you like to call out some of the cool questions from your students? Yes, so we have one question. Um, are ravens strong? Great question. Yeah, uh, ravens are super strong. Pretty much all of the raptors that we have here, so all of the, the hawks and owls and our raven that we have um, are very, very strong, particularly their beak is super strong um, and their talons or their feet are really strong as well. They can grip onto things very, very tightly. So yeah, we do a lot of things to protect ourselves if we have to handle them for some reason. Um, so we do every now and then trim their talons um, just so we keep them, um, kind of worn down, like in the wild, they would be sitting on rocks and logs and things that would help wear those down naturally. But since they're not in the wild, we have to do that ourselves. 
and that is to keep them from from hurting themselves if they're if their talons are really sharp. So anyway, um, with Edgar, we actually will we'll wrap him up in a towel. We, I call it a birdie burrito <laughs> to keep his uh, his feet and his beak away from my hands when when we have to do those things. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Great question uh, as well. Yeah. Um, we also have a question. What do the owls eat? Yeah, so I, I did mention this in the chat. Owls um, are a raptor or a bird of prey. So bird of prey, uh, birds of prey in general, they, they eat, um, they're carnivores, so they eat meat. Um, so they eat other animals. So the things that owls tend to eat most are rodents, so mice and rats. Um, they might eat a vole or a mole. Um, They'll even eat fish. Um, so they'll actually um, dive down towards water with their feet and grab a fish out of the water. And it's really cool to see. Um, and other raptors do that as well. But they'll, if, if um, it's just depending on whatever's available to them. So they might even eat snakes. Um, they might eat a turtle, which is a little bit harder to, to get into, but they, they actually can do that. They will, um, to get into a turtle, they'll actually have to hold it up and they'll fly really high in the air and then they have to drop it um, onto something because otherwise they can't break that shell because that shell is crazy strong. That is wild. <laughs> and that's, very uh, oh, sorry. we had a lot of questions about what that little machine was to track the turtles and why that's so important. Yeah, that's a great question. It was it, it was so fun to do, by the way. Like like, like as I, I think Tanika mentioned in the chat, how we it only takes like a minute in in the video. You know, not even that. It was it was it took quite a while. We were like tracking around in the in the woods and, and everything. I'll I'll let I'll let you great uh, Grace talk about um, what that tool is and and how it works and and what you're doing with it. Sure. Yeah. So I'm actually grabbing it right now, so I can give you a better look at it. Um, because it's really hard to see in the in the actual video, I can give you a look at what the controls are like. So this is the receiver. Oh, let me turn my background off. No worries. <laughs> yeah, Zoom always tries so hard to like make <laughs> sure it's things, yeah. Right. So um so this is the receiver here. It's all folded up. So these antenna that you saw, they stick out horizontally. Um, it's basically like um, a radio antenna, like for a radio station. Um, so this re actually receives the signals. Um, so basically, each of those turtles, we have eight turtles that we track using radio telemetry. And each of those turtles has something called a transmitter on their shell. It's kind of the size of a golf ball. And we, we glue it on with a really strong glue um, so it'll stay on. And those transmitters are actually releasing a signal. It's a, it's a radio wave, basically. I mean, you can't hear it unless you turn this receiver on and you turn, tune into that channel. So it's just like a radio in your car. If you wanna to listen to the radio, there's a radio station you wanna to listen to, you tune into that station and then you turn the volume up and you can hear what's being transmitted from that radio station. Um, so here are the controls. I don't know if you'll be able to see these things, but we've got a little um, on switch here and we have gain, which is sort of like volume, but it's, it's kind of the range. So if I want to track a turtle within a mile of me, I want to tune or turn the gain up to where I will actually receive a signal within a mile. Um, the other things I have on here are the channel knobs. So you just tune into that channel. And then um, the other thing is a, a pitch thing. So I can change the pitch if I don't like the way it sounds or if I can't really hear it, um, I, can, I can change it. The last thing on here is this little bar, this red bar. When I turn this on, you can see the, the light go on. And this is just another way to see how close you are to the turtle. So the closer you are, um, the higher this bar goes. So it's on a scale from one to 10. So if I'm really close to the turtle, it's gonna go all the way to 10. Um, so that's also really useful because we're using sound and we're also using sight. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that was so cool. Thank you for showing us that tool. I, I knew that people would be really curious about it. So it's really awesome that you're able to, to share a bit more about it. That's so cool. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, we love to show kids tracking because honestly, um, anyone can do it and it's, it's really fun. Um, so at our camps, actually, we let the kids um, track one of our turtles using the receiver. We, so we, we give them the, the receiver and we tune it to that channel and we just let them follow the sound. So as long as you can follow the sound or, or the sight um, on the bars there, um, you should be able to find the turtle. 
It was so cool. And and I think Tanika mentioned in the in the chat too, it was it was hard it was harder than it seemed. I was pretty impressed that Adrian found that turtle. Like it, it, it was it was pretty nestled into the leaves and they're they're well adapted to their environment. They they're quite camouflaged. And so um, right. I I, re I recall I think you told us the receiver can be a pretty handy way to or I mean sorry the transmitter can be a, a pretty handy way to kind of identify them. You can kind of see that golf ball piece of the transmitter that's on their shell. But uh, I was impressed. I was like, whoa, it was like hidden under these logs and yeah, you know, it's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And you might be wondering, you know, why are we doing this? Um, and the reason is, um, so box turtles, obviously, they're really hard to find um, because they're so well camouflaged. This telemetry gives us another way of being able to find and, and keep track of these turtles. Because if we just um, if we just marked them and let them go, which we do as well, um, it's not guaranteed that we'll find that turtle ever again. Really, there are some turtles that we've marked in the park and we've never seen a second time. Um, so it's good to find those turtles and, and get information on them that one time, but it's even better for monitoring. Um, if we can have that transmitter on them, we can see what they're doing every single week. We know exactly where they are. And so what we can do with all of that is every time we find that turtle, we make a note of its location and we can actually make a map over time. So for a whole year of tracking, if we track them every single week, we can make a map of where we found them each location we found every week and we can know exactly how far that turtle's range is. So, so box turtles have a really specific home range where they live. And so, yeah, telemetry is very useful for figuring out how big or small a turtle's home range is and whether they're interacting as well. Sometimes we actually find our transmitter turtles interacting with each other. We've seen them um, mating and laying eggs. It's very, very cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. And, and I think, yeah, you, you discussed the, yeah, one of the important parts of doing this kind of work is, yeah, so that you can better understand the species and its interactions with, with the environment that you, at least in part for the case of the Piedmont Wildlife Center, are curators of a bit. Yeah. Right. And I, I mentioned the marking thing, and I can go into a little bit of detail on that too. So the other part of the research we do is every turtle we find that's not a transmitter turtle. So those transmitter turtles, we've already picked, they're eight of them. Um, and so those are the ones we track every week. But if we find other turtles, we'll, we'll actually give them like a three letter code. Basically we name them. Um, and we put a little, um, we file a little notch into three of their scales. It, it is completely harmless to them. It doesn't hurt them at all. It's basically like trimming a fingernail because it's made of the same stuff. Uh, it's called keratin. Um, so we do that with every other turtle we find. Um, and so that's just another way of monitoring as well. Um, we call it mark and recapture. So when we find that turtle again, we'll be able to say, oh yeah, this is the turtle we found two years ago and it's grown, you know, this many grams, it's this much bigger and things like that. Cool. Grace, I mean, the work that you all doing is very interesting and it's really interesting to think about the, the lifeline, like how long turtles can live and then how long this experiment is gonna go. Because in reality, it's a possibility that one of these turtles could outlive the length of this experiment. Um, if we think about yeah. how long some turtles can live. Um, Ms. Weaver, we have time for one more question if you would like to ask one more question. All right, well, this kind of goes along with the, the last question, but can you track the turtles in water? That's a good question. So the, the, um, the transmitters themselves are waterproof um, and we actually attach it to the shell using a really strong glue called a marine epoxy. So it's actually meant to be uh, waterproof. So for those reasons, yes, we could theoretically. Now, box turtles are not aquatic, so they don't live in water. They're actually the only terrestrial turtles in North Carolina. So the only ones that live on land full time. But every now and then we do see them soaking in, in a creek, you know, it, it does definitely help them cool off. So from time to time, I have seen turtles uh, chilling out in some water in the, in the, on a hot summer day. So, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. And thank you, Ms. Weaver, um, for, for sharing some of your, your classroom's questions. And thank you students for being curious and asking those questions. That was so awesome. We had a blast. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. And thank you, Grace, for, for answering all these. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Tanika take it away. 
So just to reiterate what Steve said, thank you, Grace, and everyone over at the Piedmont Wildlife Center. We're really grateful that you all took us on this adventure because, you know, it's something that we haven't experienced, but we really got, we're really glad we got to share it with um, some of these students with DPS. Uh, so thank you, Willow, and everyone else over at Durham Public Schools. And most importantly, thank you, Ms. Weaver's class over at Y.E. Smith. We are so grateful that you all joined us today. We had a great time, and I hope you did too. Absolutely. Um, I will just say thank you as well. And thank you, Tanika. Um, so uh, next week, we are going to be heading back to the Museum of Life and Science, and we'll be meeting the amazing folks that uh, keep everything healthy and beautiful over at the Butterfly House. So um, we call that the Magic Wings Butterfly House. And it's a place with not just butterflies, there's also plants and other animals, um, including insects and uh, millipedes and things that uh, sometimes you might call bugs. But in biology, that's actually a special special term, but we'll get into that later. Um, we're also going to meet uh, some horticulturalists. Those are people who specialize in plants. And we're going to continue our conversation about conservation and learn a little bit more about how other uh, types of conservation can be done and how the Butterfly House contributes to conservation all over the world. Um, and also, we're going to see, of course, a bunch of amazingly beautiful butterflies and awesome people. And I can't wait to see you there, friends. So we will see you next week. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us on another Field Trip Fridays. Take care. Stay curious. Bye,